establish the earth. It depends on who you ask. If you ask a scientist, they'll tell you that the earth is a smidgen over 4.5 billion years old. You know, scientists. White coat, tie, hands in the pocket. No stereotypes here. Ask a young earth creationist and they'll tell you that the earth is just 10,000 years old. And young earth creationists constitute about a third of the population of the United States. So, how do scientists know that the Earth is billions of years old? Radiometric dating, they cry. Yes, say the young Earth creationists, but there are all sorts of problems with radiometric dating. We don't believe it. So, how does radiometric dating work? Well, there are lots of videos on YouTube that explain it, but in my opinion, not very well. So, I want to... Take a closer look. So let's have a look at radiometric dating in a nutshell. Scientists claim that as the earth cooled from a molten ball, so rocks solidified. And as they solidified, so they trapped isotopes. I'm going to assume you all know what an isotope is. But if not, there are lots of YouTube videos out there that you can look it up. In this respect, you can do your own research. Those rocks lay undisturbed until 4.55 billion years later, along came a bunch of nerds, I mean geologists, and they went round the globe picking up the oldest rocks that they can find from various continents. They took samples of the rocks back to the laboratory and they looked for tiny minerals called zircon crystals. I'll come back to zircons in a moment. But now we'll go to the theory bit. Zircons contain the isotopes trapped in the crystals as the rock solidified. For example, an isotope of uranium called uranium. 238. Over time, billions of years, the scientists claim the parent isotope radioactively decays to another isotope called the daughter isotope. At the end of the decay chain, the final daughter isotope is no longer radioactive. It is said to be a stable isotope. In the case of uranium 238, the stable isotope at the end of the decay sequence is lead-206. The rate that the parent isotope decays to the daughter isotope is defined by the radioactive half-life. Now I've assumed you all know what an isotope is, but I will di digress just for a moment to explain half-life. Just to be sure that we're all on the same page or YouTube video or, or whatever. If you have a pile of radioactive atoms, probably several trillion of them, but I've only had time to draw 12, then over some given time, those 12 atoms will decay to become six atoms. Then over the same given time, those six atoms will decay to become three atoms, and so on and so forth. The time it takes for the number of atoms to decrease by half is known as the half-life. It's important to understand that the half-life represents exponential decay, not linear decay, but we'll not worry about that for the moment. Let's go back to the story of radiometric dating. In the case of uranium-238, the half-life is 4.47 billion years. And so over that time, uranium-238 slowly decays into lead-206. The geologists take rocks that they've sampled and analyse them to determine the amount of parent isotope and the amount of daughter 
isotope. Then by knowing the half-life, they can calculate the amount of time necessary for the measured amount of daughter isotope to form. Let's say, for example, that there are equal amounts of parent and daughter present in the rock. Then to get this amount of daughter isotope, it must have taken one half-life. In the case of uranium-238, that's 4.47 billion years. And Annie's your aunt. That's a saying we have in the UK. No idea where it came from, but translated it means, yeah, it's a done deal. Many YouTube videos explain this process. It's nice. It's simple. So what's the problem? Is this not correct? In respect to radiometric dating, as I've just explained it, young Earth creationists have three principal objections. Firstly, they say, how do you know what the starting conditions were in that rock? As the rock solidified, how do you know it didn't trap some of the lead that you think came from the uranium when you dated it many years later? If there was lead in the original rock, that would throw all the dates out. You can't know the original isotope ratios. Then they say, how do you know that those isotopes are trapped within the rock? Some could move in, some could move out. Basic geological chemistry surely would apply and you'd get movement of the isotopes. Thirdly, they say, how do you know that the radioactive decay rates are constant? Some young Earth creationists claim that the decay rates have changed over time. Now, I'm going to take the decay rates separately because, frankly, that is just wrong. It's a complete misunderstanding. But the first two objections, actually, they have a point. That is absolutely right. How do you know what the isotope ratio was as the rock solidified? And how do you know that the system was what the geologists call a closed system? In other words, nothing moves in, nothing moves out. You can't possibly know that. So those are genuine objections. Well, yes, they would be objections if radiometric dating was done in the way that I've just explained in my little nutshell. The thing is, it's not really done like that. It's much, much more sophisticated. And in fact, it's been done in this more sophisticated way since the 1950s. So let's have a closer look at how radiometric dating is genuinely done. And to do this, we're going to do a little elementary chemistry. This is the periodic table of the chemical elements. And we've already met two elements. We've met lead, which is there, and uranium down there at the bottom. But I want to look at the simplest of all of the elements, hydrogen. An atom of hydrogen consists of a positively charged proton in the nucleus with a negatively charged electron in orbit around it. The chemistry of any element depends upon the way its electrons interact with other atoms. This is why different elements have different chemical properties. The configuration of their, their electrons is different, which gives them their basic chemistries. Now, uranium will form soluble salts, where those of lead are generally insoluble. And as a result, those soluble uranium salts are concentrated in those aforementioned zircon crystals as they form. And lead is generally excluded. Can I be 100% certain that no lead gets into the zircon crystal? No, of course I can't. But it is a good starting point, as we will see in a little while. Now, I said do your own research on isotopes, but here's a little refresher. This is the hydrogen atom that we saw previously with its positively charged proton and its negatively charged electron. Another isotope of hydrogen is deuterium. And deuterium is like hydrogen except 
Its, nu its nucleus contains a neutron, and neutrons have no charge. Another isotope of hydrogen is tritium, and tritium has two neutrons in the nucleus. So the isotopes are defined by the number of neutrons in their nucleus. Now, as I've just said, the chemistry of the element depends upon the way its electrons interact with other atoms. The nucleus, protons and neutrons, do not play any role in the chemical properties of an element. And so the chemical properties of the isotopes of the same element are all identical. Now, I should qualify that because there is an effect known as the kinetic isotope effect, which changes the rates of these reactions. These effects are really very small, particularly with the heavier elements. And so we can ignore it in the context of uh, radiometric dating. But I mention it for completeness. But if you take a glass of water out of the tap, then some very small percentage of that water will contain an atom of deuterium. In fact, water contains all the combinations of the various isotopes of hydrogen. They will all combine with, with oxygen, but they're in very, very small amounts because the natural abundances of these isotopes are very small. But water is not 100% H2O. The other isotopes will also react with the oxygen in the same way as hydrogen to form water. The stable isotope lead 206 that we met previously is at the end of that uranium decay sequence and therefore it's known as a radiogenic isotope. There's another stable isotope of lead, that's lead 204, and that was formed along with the earth and that is known as a primordial isotope. So when the Earth was formed, be it four and a half billion years ago or 10,000 years ago, lead 204 was formed at that time and it's been around all, ever since. Hence, primordial isotope. But let's remember that lead 204 and lead 206 are isotopes of the same element and therefore they have identical properties. Wherever lead 204 goes in the rocks, so does lead 206. In fact, they are very difficult to separate. You need specialist laboratory equipment in order to separate those isotopes. Can we be sure that that statement's true? Well, actually, yes, we can, because no matter where you look, you have virtually the same isotope ratio of lead 204 to lead 206. That number is 9.307. It's the same everywhere. Now what we do is we use the lead 204 as an internal standard to normalize the amounts of uranium and lead 206 in the zircon crystal. I've put internal standard in inverted commas because that's my terminology. That's not general terminology. But I've used that just as an explanation here to explain what's about to come. And of course, you have to ask the question, well, all right, how does this work? I'm about to tell you. If you go to a rock bed, you'll find many zircons all over the rock bed. And you take those back to the laboratory and you analyze them. And then depending upon the specific conditions of formation, the samples may contain different amounts of uranium and lead 206. The amount of uranium 238 is divided by the amount of lead 204. And I've color coded this just to, to be clear that lead 204 is our stable isotope, the internal standard, and uranium 238, of course, is our radioactive isotope. Likewise, you do the same thing with the lead 206. You take the amount of lead 206 and you divide it by the amount of lead 204. So you end up with two numbers. Uranium 238 divided by lead 204 and lead 206 divided by lead 204. At time zero, 
So that's when the rock forms, when it solidifies. There's some given amount of uranium will be trapped in that rock. And those, are my, those amounts might vary from one rock sample to another rock sample. Also at time zero, there may be different amounts of lead 206. Now, I've said that lead is generally excluded from those zircon crystals, but let's assume a little bit gets in, just for the sake of argument. So our zircon crystal contains a little lead. That lead may change from sample to sample, but the ratio of lead 206 to lead 204, as we've previously seen, is always going to be the same. That ratio is the same no matter where you look. And so now we can do a plot, a graph, of, of the lead 206 divided by the lead 204 versus the uranium 238 divided by the lead 204. And that graph looks like this. It's a straight line. And it's a straight line. This is at time zero. Don't forget. It's a straight line because the isotope ratio of all the samples, all those zircons that we've analysed, the isotope ratio of the lead isotopes is always the same. But the isotope ratio of the uranium uh, to lead isotopes may differ. It may be different from one sample to another, depending upon how the rock forms. Now remember that uranium-238 is decaying into lead-206. Every atom of uranium-238 ends up ultimately as an atom of lead-206. That is a one-to-one -one ratio. Over time, that line starts to tilt. As time goes on, the tilt gets more and more as the number of uranium-238 atoms decreases and the number of lead-206 atoms increase. Get a tilt on the line and the slope of that line is the number of half-lives since the formation of the rock. So if that line was at 45 degrees, showing you had equal amounts of uranium and lead, then that would take one uranium half-life to get into that position. So it's the slope of the line that gives you the date of the rock. Now, it's a very important consequence because the date of the rock does not depend upon the starting conditions. The starting conditions are actually irrelevant. It depends upon a relative change in the isotopes. And the relative change is normalised to lead 204 as an internal standard, as I've called it. So you're looking at a change of isotope ratios over time, and the starting point is not important. This plot is known as an isochron. And it was developed many, many years ago and has been used ever since. And as we will see shortly, the first definitive, I will call it, a dating of the Earth was done using the isochron method. So that first assumption that you have to know the starting conditions, that is the amount of uranium and lead in the rock as it solidifies, has now been answered. You don't need to know that. What you're actually measuring is a change in isotope ratio compared with your internal standard, which in the case of uranium lead dating is lead 204, which makes the starting conditions irrelevant. Now, if you're not yet convinced by that, hang around because we will come back to it again in just a moment. But what about assumption two? How can we be sure that the isotopes are not moving in and out of the rock. How do we know that the rock is a closed system? Well, the isochron answers that question as well. Let's have a closer look at the way the isochron is constructed. It's made from individual data points, that is the analysis of various zircons across a rock bed. Once all the data are together, then a straight line is fitted by linear regression. 
Providing that line is a straight line, it shows there's a linear relationship between the x and y axes. All right, that's fine. But what if the data were not a straight line? What if they were scattered? Well, scattering shows that something has disturbed the relationship between the isotope ratios. And one thing that would disturb that relationship is movement of isotopes in or out of the zircon. If you do not get a straight line on your isochron, then there is a good chance that the system you're measuring is not closed, in which case you know the data are not valid. So in other words, the isochron method actually is an internal check to show that everything is actually working as it's assumed to be working. So the isochron method addresses the first two assumptions. You do not need to know the isotope starting conditions within the rock and the isochron method has a built-in check to make sure the system is closed that there's no isotopes moving in or out of the zircon crystal. But what about that third assumption, that the half-lives do not change? Well, actually, there is no evidence whatsoever to show that half-lives change over time. In fact, if they did, it would violate virtually all the laws of atomic physics, and so it's pretty unlikely. Where this comes from is difficult to track down. There is one specific type of radioactive decay called electron capture which may be affected by the electron density around the isotope but the changes are very small and are very specific to certain isotopes. The other possibility is with Sumerium 146. The Half-life of Sumerian 146 was at one time taken to be 103 million years and more recently it's been re-measured at 68 million years. Now that's a big change but it doesn't mean that the half-life itself altered it's just it was an original error in the way in which the half-life was measured and the scientists have corrected that measurement. It was the scientists that found it and the scientists that made that correction. So I'm afraid that the idea that half-lives can change is just a non-starter. There is actually one other aspect to this which is rather important. Science is quantitative. You need to look at the numbers. If we take this line to represent the age of the Earth as determined by radiometric dating, 4.55 billion years. Then if we compare that with the young earth creationist view of 10,000 years, I can't actually draw a line because 10,000 years would be less than one pixel. If you do the division, you're looking for an error between the two numbers of 455,000. Now I'm quite happy to round that to 450 thousand fold error. If isotopes were decaying at 450 thousand times the rate that we think they are, then the earth wouldn't exist. The entire universe would be nothing more than a, a hot radioactive cloud of electrons and atomic particles. You cannot account for a 450 thousand fold error. It's simply not possible. Now if that's not enough to convince you, remember that we've only looked at the uranium 238 to lead 206 system. There are multiple other decay systems that are used for radiometric dating. Also consider the number of samples and the number of rocks and the sources of those rocks that have been analysed. So we've only looked at the system of uranium-238 to lead-206. But there's another isotope of uranium, uranium-235, which decays to lead-207. That has a half-life of 700 million years, which means the isochron has a different slope. You may remember I explained that the isotope ratio of lead-206 
to lead 204 is virtually the same all over the planet at 9.307. But that has not always been the case. That ratio is what it is today. It's the amounts of 206, lead 206, are increasing because uranium-235 is decaying. And so the lead-lead ratio is an isochron in its own right. In fact, lead-lead dating doesn't even require measurement of the uranium isotope. The first definitive dating of the Earth was uh, conducted by Claire Patterson in 1956, and he used lead-lead dating. Here's the isochron that he got for the lead-lead dating method. And there are numerous other methods and other systems of radioactive decay that are used for radiometric dating. I've just given uh, three of the most common here. And the vast majority use some form of isochron. Moreover, many rocks have been analysed from across the Earth, from meteorites, from rocks brought back from the moon, and even by robotic analysis from Mars. Indeed, as a scientist, I can quite definitively state that the Earth, indeed the solar system, is four and a half billion years old. Where are my pens? Who's taken my pens? I can't be a scientist without pens. If you've got my pens, who's got my pens?